you know, been talking about the brain as if it's something separate from the human that carries it a little bit. Like whenever you talk about the brain, it's easy to forget that, that that's like, that's us. Um, like how much do you, how much is the whole thing like predetermined? <laughs> like how much is it already encoded in there? And how What's much the is it? it the <laughs> what's the uh, the the actions, the decisions, mm. the judgments, the you mean like who you are, who you are? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, great question. Right. So there used to be a big debate about nature versus nurture, and we now know that it's always both. You you can't even separate them because you come to the table with a certain amount of nature. For example, your whole genome and so on. The experiences you have in the womb, like whether your mother is smoking or drinking, things like that, whether she's stressed, so on, those all influence how you're going to pop out of the womb. From there, everything is an interaction between all of your experiences and the, and the nature. What I mean is, it, I think of it like a space-time cone, where you have, you drop in the world, and depending on the experiences that you have, you might go off in this direction, or that direction, or that direction, because there's interaction all the way, your experiences determine what happens with the expression of your genes. So some genes get repressed, some get expressed, and so on. And you, you actually become a different person based on your experiences. There's a whole field called uh, epigenomics, which is, or epi, epigenetics, I should say, um, which is about the epigenome. And that is the, you know, sort of the layer that sits on top of the DNA and causes the genes to express differently. That is directly related to the experiences that you have. So if you know, just as an example, they take rat pups and, you know, one group is sort of placed away from their parents and the other group is groomed and licked and taken good care of. That changes their gene expression for the rest of their life. They go off in different directions in this, in the space-time cone. Um, so yeah, this is, this is of course why it matters that we take care of children and pour money into things like education and good child care and so on for children broadly. Um, because these formative years matter so much. So, is there a free will? Th this is this is a, a great. I apologize question. for the for the absurd high level philosophical questions. No, no, these are my favorite kind of questions. Here, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. We yeah. don't know. If you ask most neuroscientists, they'll say that we can't really think of how you would get free will in there, because as far as we can tell, it's a machine. It's a very complicated machine enormously sophisticated, 86 billion neurons, about the same number of glial cells. Each of these things is as complicated as the city of San Francisco. Each neuron in your head has the entire human genome in it. It's expressing millions of, of gene products. These are incredibly complicated biochemical cascades. Each one is connected to 10,000 of its neighbors, which means you have, you know, like half a quadrillion connections in the brain. So it's this incredibly complicated thing, but it is fundamentally it appears to just be a machine. And therefore, if there's nothing in it that's not being driven by something else, then it seems it's hard to understand where free will would come from. So that's the camp that pretty much all of us fall into. But I will say, our science is still quite young. And you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the history of science. And what, the thing that always strikes me as interesting is when you look back at any moment in science, everybody believes something is true. And they just, they simply didn't know about, you know, mm -hmm. what Einstein revealed or whatever. And so, who knows? I and mean, they, they a, all feel like that we've, at any moment in history, they all feel like we've converged to the final answer. Exactly, exactly. Like, all the yeah. pieces of the puzzle are there. And I think that's a funny illusion that's worth getting rid of. And, and in fact, this is what drives good science, is recognizing that we don't have most of the puzzle pieces. So, as far as the free will question goes... I don't know. At the moment, it seems, wow, it would be really impossible to figure out how something else could fit in there. But, you know, 100 years from now, our textbooks might be very different than they are now. I mean, could I ask you to speculate where do you think free will could be squeezed into there? Like, what's that even? Um, is, is, it, is it possible that our brain just creates kinds of illusions that are useful for us? Or like what, where, where could it possibly be squeezed in? <laughs> well, let me let me give a speculation answer yeah. to your very nice question, but but 
you know, don't, and the listeners to this podcast, don't quote me on this. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm not saying this is what I believe to be true, but let me just give an example. I give this at the end of my book, Incognito. So the whole book of Incognito is about, you know, all the, what's happening in the brain. And essentially I'm saying, look, here's all the reasons to think that free will probably does not exist. But at the very end, I say, look, imagine that you are, um, you know, imagine that you're a Kalahari Bushman and you find a radio in the sand and you've never seen anything like this. And you you look at this radio and, and you realize that when you turn this knob, you hear voices coming from it. There are voices coming from it. So being a, you know, a, a radio materialist, you try to figure out like, how does this thing operate? So you take off the back cover and you realize there's all these wires. And when you take out some wires, the voices get garbled or stop or whatever. And so what you end up developing is a whole theory about how this connection, this pattern of wires gives rise to voices. But it would never strike you that in distant cities, there's a radio tower and there's invisible stuff beaming. And that's actually the origin of the voices. And this is just necessary for it. So I mentioned this just as a speculation, say, look, how would we know, what we know about the brain for absolutely certain is that if when you damage pieces and parts of it, things get jumbled up. But how would you know if there's something else going on that we can't see, like electromagnetic radiation, that is what's actually generating this? Yeah, you paint a beautiful example of uh, of how totally, because we don't know most of how our universe works, how totally off base we might be with our science. Yeah. Until I mean, we I mean, um, yeah, I mean that's inspiring. That's beautiful. It's kind of terrifying, it's humbling, it's all all all, all of the above. And the uh, important and the important part just to recognize is that of course we're in the position of having massive unknowns and you know w- we have of course the known unknowns and that's all the things we're pursuing in our labs and trying to figure out that but there's this whole space of unknown unknowns things we haven't even realized we haven't asked yet. 